joining us for our online worship service. Today is a holiday in our Lutheran Church calendar, Reformation Sunday. Today we will celebrate the anniversary of the first steps of the Reformation movement in the 16th century. Some things to note, everything in our service will be available on your screen. We invite you to join in praying out loud in the bold print through our readings, participating in our offering, and as well as getting ready some bread and wine or juice or water for you to use if you would like to receive communion today. Pastor Megan, that's me, is actually out on study leave this week, and today is the last day of that. But we are so thankful for our Synod staff for helping step in to provide us with a message on this very special day. with us today. The peace of the Lord be with you all. I invite you to share a sign of peace with those in your household. If you're on our Zoom or if you're watching this later even, you can hold up a peace sign and share Christ's peace with one another. If you are on our Facebook or YouTube, we invite you to share a sign of peace in our comment section. Take a moment to receive, to share, to experience the peace of Christ. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who creates, redeems, and sustains us and all of creation. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Faithful God, have mercy on us. 
We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We turn from your loving embrace and go our own ways. We pass judgment on one another before examining ourselves. We place our own needs before those of our neighbors. We keep your gift of salvation to ourselves. Make us humble, cast away our transgressions, and turn us again to life in you, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God hears the cries of all who call out in need, and through his death and resurrection, Christ has made us his own. Hear the truth that God proclaims. Your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Led by the Holy Spirit, live in freedom and newness to do God's work in the world. Amen. I invite you to pray with me. Almighty God, gracious Lord, we thank you that your Holy Spirit renews the church in every age. Pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep them steadfast in your word. Protect and comfort them in times of trial. Defend them against all enemies of the gospel. And bestow on the church your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Verse 31 through 34. The days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. A covenant that they broke. Though I was their husband, says the Lord, but this is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. No longer will they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin. Our next reading is Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be moved 
and though the mountains shake in the depths of the sea, though the waters rage and foam, and though the mountains tremble with its tumult, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be shaken. God will help it at the break of day. The nations rage and the kingdoms shake. God speaks and the earth melts away. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come now, regard the works of the Lord. What desolations God has brought upon the earth. Behold, the one who makes war to cease in all the world, who breaks the bow and shatters the spear and burns the shields with fire. Be still then and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Our next reading is Romans chapter 3, 19 through 28. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. There is no distinctions since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by His blood, effective through faith. He did this to show His righteousness, because in His divine forbearance He had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. By what law? By that of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The Holy Gospel for this Reformation Sunday from the 8th chapter of St. John. Then Jesus said to those who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. 
So if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace and peace to you on this Reformation Sunday. Today we remember and we give thanks for the, the process of reformation, the process of renewal that began 503 years ago when Martin Luther uh, posted the 95 Theses to the church door in Wittenberg. You know, as we think back to what was going on in Martin Luther's day and think about our day today, it really strikes me that there are some real parallels, there are some real similarities between what are going on in the two different times. And I'm particularly thinking about the turmoil that existed, both, uh, both the inner turmoil that Martin Luther experienced, but also the social turmoil that was happening all around him. And by inner turmoil for Martin Luther, what I was thinking about, you, if you've seen the Martin Luther movies, if you read the books, you know that for uh, the, the whole first part of, her life, of his life, he seriously feared that he just wasn't good enough for God to love him. Even though he did his best to be a faithful religious person, he became a priest, he said his prayers, he went to church, he did pilgrimages. He constantly felt, he constantly pictured God as a, as a judge up above who was looking down and seeing everything that he did. And he always feared that no, no matter how much he did, he just wasn't enough. There just wasn't enough to his life and that God could never love him because of his shortcomings. But at the same time that this inner turmoil was happening within Luther, there was also tremendous social upheaval and turmoil around him. The biggest crisis that was happening in Luther's world in Europe was that their biggest neighbor to the east, the, the, the Turkish Empire of the Ottomans, had declared war on Europe. And the massive Ottoman army was within 40 miles of Vienna, Austria, which was sort of the capital of Europe at that time. So they were facing the being overcome and overruled by uh, an enemy force. But at the same time that the Ottomans were threatening them, the, the nations within Europe themselves were at war with each other. They were constantly fighting with each other. And so the French were fighting the British and the Germans were in competition with the Spanish and the Italians. And while the leaders at the top, while the political, uh, political leaders, the kings and the princes, they were also fighting and vying with the spiritual leaders, the popes and the archbishops. Meanwhile, the people down below, all the working people, the peasants, the farmers, they were going through an incredible time of, of poverty and starvation. They were having a hard time making it. And then there was the disease factor. Twice during Luther's time, black plague rushed through Europe, killing hundreds of thousands of people. And then Luther, contrib Luther contributed to the upheaval himself, to the turmoil himself, because of his fierce attack against Jewish people. Luther wrote a 300-page book uh, telling the German kings and princes they should imprison, they should arrest, they should even put to death Jewish people simply for being Jewish. So it was a time of incredible turmoil. And so here we are today, back in on Reformation Day 1517, there was there was pandemic, there was poverty and unemployment, there was political fighting, there was violence. And here we are on Reformation Sunday 2020, and there is pandemic, there is, there is poverty and unemployment, there is political fighting, and there is violence in our own streets and towns and around the world. So I think that as Luther experienced both inner turmoil and outer turmoil, I think the same is true for many of us, that we too are having our own times of emotional and spiritual struggle. So I'd like to talk for that a minute. Why is this such a stressful time? It really is. Well, I've just mentioned there's all these exterior things going on, but I do think the, the underlying reality of the pandemic is a major factor in the turmoil and the stress that we're, that we're experiencing. Most of us, myself included, are for very good medical and safety reasons. We are generally limiting the contact we have with other people. Uh, we're staying indoors, we're working out of our houses. Uh, but still, even when we do go out to do grocery shopping or something, we're constantly aware of, of uh, the dangers that exist and what are we touching and who is breathing near us. So it's like we're constantly living in a threatening environment. 
for very good medical reasons, as I said, we are tending to, to stay by ourselves. But what's happening to a lot of us over time is that we then begin to feel alone. We begin to, begin, we get, we begin to feel isolated. We even have a higher incidence in our society of discouragement and depression. Plus, a lot of people are feeling exhausted with all the extra work that it takes to, to do grocery shopping, to do your work, to constantly be planning how to do it safely. A lot of people are just simply feeling exhausted. And I think that as we struggle with the, that emotional turmoil, it also becomes spiritual turmoil because at some point, the question begins to get formed in our mind, how long is this gonna go on? And, and does God care about us? Is God gonna do something about that? Some of you will remember that a, a month ago when I preached, I talked about the story of Jesus and the, and the disciples crossing the Sea of Galilee when a big storm came up and the disciples were afraid they were gonna drown and so they woke Jesus up saying, Lord, Lord, do you even care if we perish? I think that's our spiritual dilemma, our spiritual upheaval today, is that we say to God, God, this just keeps going and going. Do you care about us, God? What's going to be the outcome? And, and how can we stay hopeful in the midst of all this? I think that's the key spiritual question for us. That's the, that's the key spiritual turmoil. How do we stay hopeful in the midst of so many threats and so many uncertainties? I think that what Martin Luther uh, rediscovered 503 years ago is a word of strength and hope for us today. I use the word rediscovered because it was right there. It had never been lost, but somehow the church had lost it. Through his spiritual study, through his own spiritual formation process with the help of good friends and good mentors, Martin Luther rediscovered two key things that are at the heart of God. Number one, that God loves us and always will and will never abandon us. And number two, God not only fills us with love, God gives us, gives us purpose. Our lives count for something. Those are the two pillars of Lutheran teaching. Those are the two central posts on which Luther bases teaching. But more importantly, those are the two posts on which our hope rests. That number one, we are, we are loved ones of God. We hear those words and they, we know them in our heads that it's often harder for us to love ourselves. We know that God loves us, but it's harder to love ourselves. We are, are often our own worst, worst critics. We are our worst judges. But Luther again and again enjoyed saying to people, God is with us and God is for us. God is not indifferent. God is not up in the heavens, far away from us. God is right with us. God is within us and that God loves us no matter what. And that secondly, God not only fills us with love, but God gives meaning to our life. In Luther's day, it was thought that only the, the top people had lives that were important. Only the top people had real callings, the kings and the popes and the princes and the, and the priests. But Martin Luther says, that's not the way Jesus worked. Jesus treated everybody as a person of importance and that God had given to them, God has given to us a mission in this world. God has given us gifts and abilities and things to do so that we work with God in helping bring the life and the love that God wants for everybody. I remember talking to a, uh, a woman, a pastor from uh, the African nation of Zaire, who was one of the main presenters at a workshop that I attended uh, many years ago. I told this story before, some of you will have heard it, but it just fits so well with Reformation Sunday that I have to tell it again. The, the pastor that I spoke at uh, had an important story because she was, the, she was the first woman to be ordained a Lutheran pastor in Zaire. And she became the pastor to a number of uh, congregations kind of out in the rural area of Zaire. <clears throat> she was very effective as a pastor to such an extent that the Lutheran World Federation hired her to be the regional director for their hunger work in Zaire and in, in the surrounding countries in Africa. She became the regional director, both for the food distribution program, when people just needed to get food supplies, corn and wheat and rice and so forth. But more importantly, the work that Lutheran World Federation was doing and, and what she uh, really uh, organized and oversaw was agricultural development that there'd be training programs for farmers to learn how to grow better, prop, better crops and, 
and bigger crops so they could feed themselves but sell food for profit as well. And this pastor also uh, supervised an economic development program whereby small loans were given to women in the villages and they would use the money to start their own business. So a particular woman in the village would buy chickens and go into the egg business. Or another woman would buy a small plot of land to buy enough food, not just to feed her family, but to, to make some money and she could be able to send her kids to school that way. And so she was talking about all this great work that Lutheran World Federation was doing in Zaire and the surrounding countries. And in the question and answer period, someone raised their hand and said, with all these good things happening, do you feel, do you feel optimistic about the future of Africa? And she thought for a moment, and then she said, the problems in Africa are still so immense and still complex that I typically don't use the word optimistic because it seems in some ways too shallow of a word or too glib. What I do say is that I am insistently hopeful about what God is doing in our midst. She said, what I do say is that the God who sent Jesus to teach and to feed and to heal and to save is a God who wants life for us. Therefore, I am insistently hopeful that God will also bring life to us today. And the God who raised Jesus from the dead on Easter morning is a God whose power is greater than all of the forces of death around, not only the force of death itself, but the force of starvation or the force of corruption or the force of malfeasance. The God who raised Jesus has power over all this. And so I insistently hold on to this power and I call upon this power of the Spirit to also work through us so that we can do God's will in this time. We live in such a time of turmoil. We live in such a time of upheaval. And so here we are on this Reformation Day and the promise, the promise about which we can be insistently hopeful is that God promises first to give us life, second to breathe God's love into us, but also to give us purpose, to give us abilities and vision so that we can be part of God's work of bringing life and love to the world. And that's what we celebrate today. And that's, that's how, it, first to our own inner turmoil, we can remind ourselves that God loves us, that we are one of God's dear ones. That's who you are. You are one of God's dear ones no matter what. But in the face of everything that's going on, we can cling to the hope and to the strength and the power of God to work through us. And the way we do that is by just, just living the life and living the love that God sends to us. Jesus said in the gospel lesson today, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. The truth, first of all, will free you from your shame and through, from your self, from your self judgments so that you might know you are a blessed one of God. But the truth will also free you to live with God and to be part of God's movement, to be part of Jesus's movement of bringing life to the world. And that life gets shared in the details, in all the details of our life. God wants, wants peace for us. And so the Spirit comes to stir us up so that we might practice that peace. We might practice being peacemakers. I use the word practice very intentionally because it's like a musical instrument. We have a beautiful musical instrument, but you have to practice it to play it well. So it is with faith. God wants peace for us. And so we work with God and let the Spirit urge us to practice being peacemakers. God wants a community for us. God wants people of every ethnic origin, of every color of skin, to live together as God's prized people. There's just too much separation right now, too much racism, too much division. God wants community for us. And so we say yes to that. We let the Holy Spirit stir us up to come together and to work through our differences and to admit our own prejudices and to reach out to others as dear siblings, dear sisters and brothers. God wants food for children to eat and affordable houses for families. And God wants good work, good paying jobs for people. God wants there to be health care for people. And so we say yes to that in the same way that we care about people's hearts and souls and bring them words of forgiveness and words of grace. So we also come and work with God and let the Spirit, Spirit uh, stir us up so that we can practice being hospitable and caring towards one another. God also wants 
uh, good government for us. God wants good government for us. And so we say yes to that by being good citizens and, and we go and vote. I bring that up because uh, Martin Luther talked a lot about government and about citizenship. Voting hadn't started yet in Martin Luther's day, so you don't read anything where he talks about telling people to vote. But Luther, Martin Luther clearly saw government as a gift from God. The, the idea of government, the dream of good government, of good laws and justice, that's the dream God gives to us. But we need to make that happen. And so Luther says, amongst all of your callings, you, you're called as a parent, perhaps, you're called as a worker, you're called as a volunteer. Amongst all your callings, Luther said, you're also called to be a citizen. Government works when citizens work well together and do what's right. And so I'm convinced, I'm convinced that even though Luther didn't know about voting in his day, I'm convinced that Luther would come to us today and say, go out and vote. You've got your ballots in the mail, go out and vote. In fact, what I recommend for you today is two things. One is at offering time, put your offering in the offering box. And then after worship, go and put your ballot in the mailbox. It's how we live out our calling as God, of God, to be part of God's movement to build houses and cities and places and nations and a world and a planet that is cared for and that knows God's love. So that's what we're called to today. God's love gets acted out in the details of our lives. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. First to receive the love, the constant love, which God has for you no matter how, no matter what. And then to live out that love and bring it to people's hearts, to people's souls, to people's lives, to the communities that we live in. God wants life for us. And so we say yes to that. And we let the Spirit move us to be part of that action, that discipleship of bringing life to others. May God bless you in your ministry. May God bless you in the way you live out Christ's love to others each day. In Jesus' name, amen. has made us new people through our baptism into Christ and our response of faith. Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. 
On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With confidence in God's grace and mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Renew and inspire the church in the freedom of the gospel, O God. Where the church is in error, reform it. Where the church speaks your truth, strengthen it. Where the church is divided, unify it. Ignite in us the working of the Holy Spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As the earth changes, as mountains shake and the waters roar, may we care for this planet as a holy habitation for all living things. Sustain all peoples and lands recovering from natural disasters of any kind. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide areas of the world divided or traumatized by conflict, especially in our own land. Free all from slavery and human trafficking and protect all in harm's way. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Release those living in bondage to debts, chronic pain, or addiction. Grant healing to those who are ill. Especially today, we pray for the Taco family, for the Grambo family, for Ray Davenport and Donna Zimmerman, for Nick Croy, for the Custer family, the Thibodeau family, the Bailey family, for Dana Hughes, for the Yaki family, for Krista Croy, for Roxanne Olison, for Del Elliott, for Brian, and for all for whom we pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In this family of faith, we give thanks for courageous voices that have remained firm in their commitment to the one who frees us from sin and death. Centered in your grace, unify us in the hope of the gospel. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For this week, during Election Day and in the days and weeks to come after, Lord, we pray for your guidance and wisdom, for your peace and comfort, and for your presence in all things. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. At this time, I invite the congregation gathered by technology and the Holy Spirit to lift up your own petitions this morning. You may pray them out loud, silently to yourself. If you're in our uh, Facebook or YouTube, you may comment your prayer petitions during this time. Take a few moments. For what do the people of God pray for today? Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Even in death, you free us and give us a place in your house. We give thanks for our ancestors who have shown us truth and freedom, especially for Martin Luther and those who work for the renewal of the church. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Listen as we call on you, O God, and enfold in your loving arms all for whom we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We lift our voices, our hands, our lives up to our Lord in response to the generous gifts God shares with us. Each week we share our gifts for ministry in our offering. To continue with your offering, checks may be mailed to the church office. You can also give electronically. Visit bethanylongview.org slash coronavirus for links to give online or via the Give Plus app. We give thanks for the gifts God shares with us. We give thanks for the abundant life God brings us, and we give thanks for you. Built on the rock, the church shall stand, even when steeples are falling, from old as fires in every land, bells the Lord chiming and gold. Calling the young and old to rest. 
Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. You have set before us these gifts of your good creation. Prepare us for your heavenly banquet. Nourish us with this rich food and drink and send us forth to set tables in the midst of a suffering world. Through the bread of life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. On the night our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he was gathered with his disciples. He took bread, broke it, and blessed it, and gave it to them to eat, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way Jesus took the cup, he blessed it, and he gave it to them to drink, saying, Take and drink, all of you. This is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sin. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim our Lord's death until he comes again. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. I invite you to pray with me the prayer our Lord Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All are welcome to the Lord's table. You do not need to be a member of our church or our denomination to commune with us virtually. We invite you during this time to feel the Spirit's presence and join the entire body of Christ together. You may use bread or wine or juice or water in your home. You may give to one another in your household or listen to my voice saying, This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. You may also choose to fast from communion today and hear this blessing. You belong to God. You are loved. You are not alone. Amen. Come to the banquet table where Christ gives himself as food and drink.
We give you thanks, gracious God, that you have once again fed us with food beyond compare. The body and blood of Christ, lead us from this place nourished and forgiven into your beloved vineyard to wipe away the tears of all who hunger and thirst. Guided by the example of the same Jesus Christ and led by the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Mother and God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you and lead you into the way of truth and life. Amen. Happy birthday this week to Martha on the 31st, and happy anniversary to John and Nancy. May you all be able to find moments of celebration this week. A few other announcements. Um, thank you all for joining us for our Reformation Sunday. If you forgot to wear red as you're watching and participating in worship right now, feel free to put on red for the rest of the day in celebration of our red season for Reformation. A few things going on this week, breakfast group phone calls at 8 o'clock on Tuesday, women's Bible study on Zoom at 10.30, and our executive committee will be meeting on Zoom at 12 o'clock, followed by our reopening subcommittee meeting at 12.15. And the duct tape uh, small group will be meeting on October 29th at 9 o'clock. Pledge cards are due to the office on Saturday, October 31st. Happy Halloween. And on Sunday, November 1st is All Saints Day and All Saints Sunday. And we'll be celebrating all of those who have gone before us, our loved ones who have passed and those that we care about. And if you um, have not sent me your photos already, please get them to me by Wednesday this week, by October 28th. And I'll be sure to include them in our Sunday uh, worship service. If you have any questions about that, give me a call on Tuesday, and I'll be able to help you get that all sorted. And a few other things, like check your November newsletter that will be coming out on Sunday next week. There's a lot going on, and we're getting ready for Advent, and there's a lot of really exciting things. So I hope you'll continue to join us. And with all of that... Go in peace. Remember the poor. Thanks be to God. God bless you all. We'll see you soon.